Hey, we're in a year of what we've entitled Come Follow Me. Everyone say, Come Follow Me. And this is a year of discovering and discussing what it means to first and foremost be a disciple of Jesus and what does it look like to then actually help make disciples in, in, in our life. And so first and foremost, how do we follow Jesus? But secondly, how do we encourage others to follow us as we follow Christ? And what we'd all know by now is that this is a transformation journey is what I would call it. The journey of come follow me is not one of, hey, here are your three dot points of following Jesus. And if we just do this, we're good. If you have them, please come and let me know. I would love to. But it's not that. It's a transformation journey. It's a journey of one step at a time, one, one maybe challenge from the Holy Spirit at a time, one encouragement at a time, one encounter at a time. We are transformed to be more like Christ. And that is the process of come follow me. When Jesus says, hey, come and follow me, it's not, hey, you have to do all these things. It's, hey, be open to the transformation I bring to your life. And my message this morning is really rooted and grounded in that idea. And I wonder if you can turn with me in your Bibles right before I pray and dismiss the band to Matthew 16, verse 24 to 26. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. This is my go-to translation, that or the NIV or my go-to, to be honest. I love, love a good NIV. Sometimes just some of the words are just a little bit, you know, so then I go to the NLT. Anyways, not important right now. <laughs> so you're going to get a lot of random thoughts every now and then. Matthew 16, verse 24, 26. This is Jesus talking. It says this, Then Jesus said to His disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? The title of my message this morning, if you're taking notes, is simply this, from want to will. From want to will. Why don't you join with me in prayer this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your presence. We're so thankful for your grace. We're so thankful that we get to be in a relationship with you, Jesus, not because of anything we've done, but because of what you did on that cross. And so this morning, we just pray that your word would be a mirror unto us, Lord God, that would reflect what needs to be transformed in our life and that we would be open to that transformation. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would step forward and that I would step back. I pray that you would increase and that I would decrease. And that as a result, we would all be transformed and changed by your word this morning and that we would all represent you in a better way. In your precious and mighty name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen. Can I take a second to talk to all the control freaks in the room? Is that all right? (laughs) Some of you are laughing because you're sitting next to one. (laughs) And you're trying really hard not to look over at the person. You're like, don't, you're like, like, stay locked on me. Trust me, it's going to be better. All the control freaks in the room, right? Anyone brave enough to admit they are a control freak? Anyone who doesn't have their hand up, it's because you like to be in control and you are also the control freak. (laughs) Man, the control, see, I think all of us have a little bit of a control freak in us, all right? I think we all do, all right? I I, I think it's just how it is. Uh, And you know how I know this? Uh, Because some of you, some of you really care about grammar. Yeah, all of a sudden, a few of my hands are, oh, maybe he's talking about me. Like, like, someone better run if you use the wrong your. Oh, if you see someone put that in an email or like someone sends you a text, maybe like myself who's terrible at like checking their text messages before they send it and it's full of like five spelling errors and you receive that and you are like, what is wrong with you, Dan? There is literally autocorrect on your phone. You know, so like maybe a few more of you are like, oh, maybe that is me, a control freak, wrong or, or apostrophe or comma in the wrong place. Oh, I never got commas when I was younger, just to say that. So when I was in school, I used to write essays. I just like used to put them in random places where I think they would. <laughs> Looking back now, I can understand why I maybe got a few worse marks on my English, right? So some of you, it's grammar. Um, some of you, you love to what I would call backseat drive. 
Like you, what? there was a few ums that happened there. Sam. I was like, whoa. Or, or maybe what I would call like passenger seat drive as well. I'm gonna throw that in there. You know how I know that? Because I drive with my wife. I drive and she sits in the passenger seat and we're about 100 meters away from a car that's braking and she will yell at me ferociously, Dan, brake! <laughs> Anyone else know what I'm talking about? Yeah? She also does this thing where we're, we're at like a, I'm turning left, you know, or, or turning right on, on a T-junction road and I'm trying to look down the other side of the window and she will lean forward <laughs> to look and check as if she's the one who is driving. <laughs> what is going on? And then I try and lean back the other way and she leans back the other I'm like, oh my good, I am driving, just let me see. I'm like, you are not in control of the car right now. That's me. <laughs> so like maybe, maybe you relate to that. Um, maybe you relate to maybe social media, that you like to be in control of social media. Oh, like you spend 15 minutes, not only on your edits of your photo, but you spend half an hour on your caption. Because if we're really real, we all care more about the caption than we do the photo. Right, like because like the photo is edited, but if you say the wrong words, oof, and if someone points out a spelling error at your grammar people, control people, get on the gram and they're like, hey, you did not use the right sentence here. Then that happened to me the other day. I posted about worship in the round tonight, uh, which is gonna be on tonight. I didn't post it tonight, but during the week I posted about it. And I said, because in my brain, it was Friday and I thought it was Saturday. And so I was like, oh, I can't wait to be in the house tomorrow worshiping with everyone. And someone messaged me, they're like, uh, today's Friday, Dan. And I was like, so fair. So I quickly deleted it because I wanted to be in control. <laughs> or maybe, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe this one relates. Maybe you like the toilet paper a certain way around. <laughs> there was a lot of buying just then. Wow. Is this a hot debated topic in homes? Which way do we think it goes? Like, up, well, I would say up against the wall or away from? Away? Away from? Hands up if you think away from. We're going to have an altar call for you guys later on. It's going to be great. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, but it's like, you know, you're like, no, there's a certain way the toilet paper has to go. And I'm like, what? <laughs> it all goes the same place. Let's be real here. <laughs> like, we're so fussy about which way it goes, right? It's like, it has to go, like I learned when I got married, I cared a lot about where our towels are hanging, right? Weird things, right? Like, like if my towel is moved, right? Like it really stresses me out, you know? Like I'm a control freak, right? I also learned uh, that I really like having the TV remote in my hand. I like that control, right? Like if someone else has a remote, I just start freaking out in my head. <laughs> We could be watching exactly the same show and everything, but it's just something about it. I just want to be in control of it, right? And uh, recently, well, not recently, but eight months ago, we, we welcomed into the world our beautiful daughter, Zarea, and she is incredible. But I learned I like to be in control, right? Because as soon as I became a dad, the, the, just the presence of a dad came on me. What do I mean by that? I started walking around closing every single door in the house whenever it's not being used. I started walking around, you know, like turning off every single light because I'm like, no, this is, I'm in, this is our house. I want to be in control of our house. And then, then I realized that our air conditioning has this little panel on it. And the panel is amazing because you can turn off like where you want the air conditioning to go. So right, you, you have the heater and you're not using certain rooms, so I turn them off. But then you can also adjust the percentage of which, like how much it, it is deployed in that room. So I can turn it on in that room and I can be like, hey, 50% go to that room. It is amazing, but man, I have issues of control because <laughs> Jesus help me, right? If Ashari changed it by 10%, I would know. I know, I have a sense. It's like a spider sense. I think we all like to be in control, right? We are all creatures of control. Maybe for you, you can relate to that, but maybe let's get a little bit more real in the house. Maybe you're trying to control things like your kids. Maybe you're trying to control things in your life like your spouse. Maybe you're trying to control things in your life like how people perceive you and your image and all your thoughts are so concerned with how what others think of you and as a result, you try and control situations. Maybe you're trying to control just the trajectory of your purpose and your lifestyle. See, we are all creatures of control. And if you're sitting there saying, no, I'm not, once again, I'll just point out that might be because you like to be in control of your life. See, control has a deadly cycle, all right? When you like to be in control, and when you're in control, the fear of losing control kicks in. But when you're scared of losing control, what do you do? You fight to have more control. But then when you get more control, what happens? The fear of losing that control kicks in and all of a sudden you're fighting for more control again in your life. And all of a sudden, bit by bit, suddenly what we do is that we slowly edge God out of our life. 
Why? Because whenever you're in control of a situation, you're saying, I want to be God in this situation. That's what you're saying. Whenever I want the remote, it's because I want to be the one who decides. I want to be in control. I want to be the one who determines what we watch. And yet in things in my life, how often do I place myself in the position that only God should be in and try and control, decide and dictate in my life what is good, right, wrong, just, unjust, holy, unholy, theologically correct, untheological. All these things are revolved around the fact that I place myself in the wrong position in my life. And what it requires is for me to understand the deadly cycle of control and surrender control to the one person who was designed to carry full control, and that being God Himself. That being God Himself. See, every time we want to be in control, we need to understand and realize that we're trying to put ourselves in God's position in that area. And this is the thing, our world encourages us to be in control. It does. How many of you heard the term, take back control of your life? Take control of your life. You choose. It encourages us, right? We see commercials, the, the, the insurance or the bank that goes, hey, we're all about creating flexibility so you can follow your dreams. All right? But isn't it a scary day where our philosophy for life is built on a commercial slogan? Where we make decisions and interact with people and with God based on this idea of I want to be in control, I need to follow my dreams, I need to follow my heart, I need to understand, I, hey, God's going, yeah, and we start to put language around it even where it's going, God's given me these things. He's given me these dreams. And there might be a truth to that, but what I want to encourage you is this, is that the call was never to follow my dreams, but to follow Jesus wherever He leads me. You need to understand and realize this. Does God have good things? Is He a good God? Does He have incredible things for you? And does He have a plan and a purpose for your life? Absolutely. But if number one priority in our life is to follow my heart, to follow my dreams, to be in control, I've missed the mark on what a follower is. To be a disciple of Jesus isn't to follow my dreams, it's actually to follow Jesus. It's to submit those things to Him and not to go, man, I want to follow, I want to do what the world does, but I want to be counter culture to the world. And instead of following my dreams, I'm going to submit to Him and follow Him wherever He wants to lead me. And so if you remember the scripture we read just before, Jesus says this to the disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. Now, this is a message I'm very well aware um, it's not necessarily like a feel-good message, but I'm okay with that <laughs> because it's the Word of God. Because if we really were to look at that Scripture and it says, give up your own way and follow me. When I stop and ask myself that question of how well I'm doing with that, I've got to be honest with you, some days it's really bad. <laughs> some days, even though I am in the routine, I'm not in the revelation of that Scripture. Even though I might be in the routine of a relationship with God, I'm not in the revelation of what does it mean to give up my own ways and to follow Him. Because here's the thing, we're all in the same boat. We're all in the same boat here, right? So none of us are better off than other because it says give up your ways and follow Him. Which means all of us have to have this posture of surrender in our life. See, we are called to follow not my dreams, not my heart, but my Jesus. And to follow Jesus requires me to surrender control to Him, to surrender my preference for God's pathway, to surrender and exchange my dream for God's plan. And Jesus is the greatest example of this. You'll go and find in the Gospels that right before Jesus goes to the cross, He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he prays this prayer, his anguish, and he knows what he needs to do. And he's in God's will, and he's, and he's in God's plan. But if he's honest, his dream, and if we, what we read is true and correct, he says this. He goes, God, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. In other words, his want in that moment isn't to have to die. But he surrenders it to God's plan. And so when we're to be a follower of Jesus and do what he does, he's not asking us to do anything that he didn't do. Jesus himself went, hey, I'm going to surrender my life. I'm going to surrender my want. I'm going to surrender my dream, my plan of what I do or don't want to do. But why? Because the Father's will is greater. So Jesus models this to us and tells us to do it. So it stands to reckon that we 
might want to take his words into consideration. And can I just say, this is honestly, I think, why we like religion so much. What I mean by that, if you're new here, I would define what we believe as a relationship with Jesus and with God. And religion speaks more about do this, don't do this. And as a result, you'll find good favor. Whereas a relationship says, hey, you find good favor with God first. And out of that comes a revelation of how changed life, right? But the reason we like religion is because we like to be in control. It's true, right? How often can we slip into religion? Why? Because we like to be in control. Because if we can do this and not do that and just do this, do this, we're good. I can take it off. I'm in control then. There's no, you know, like I, I, I know my limits. I know the boundaries. Then, then I'm good. But, but Jesus calls us to far more than just religion. He calls us to a relationship of following Him, which requires a surrender of control to Him. See, a sign of spiritual maturity is desiring God's will over my wants. Let me say it again. A, a, a sign of spiritual maturity is desiring God's will over my wants. In order to follow, we have to give up control. It's literally in the name follower. If you're to be a follower, you can't be in control about where you go. Because otherwise, you're not the follower. It's a question. Are you following Jesus? What does that look like? Is He in control of every step? Is He in control of your time, your energy, your prayer? If he is, is He in control of your life? Are we a follower of Christ? See, we need to recognize that my wants are from a finite point of view, but God's will is from an infinite point of view. See, often I think that we like, to get, we like control when, when our perspective gets too small, right? We start focusing on the details more than the direction, right? Like it's often a good indicator for me. Why? Because we start to look at it from a finite point of view. We start to look at it as if this is the only life we're ever going to give, forgetting that if you're in Jesus Christ, we have an eternity spent with Him, which is our home and which we're designed for. And that is where He's calling us back to. But He's got us here for a reason and a purpose. And that purpose is to follow Him and to create followers that can follow Him as well. And that's why we're here. But if we lose sight of the perspective, we tend to creep more towards control instead of surrender. John 30, uh, 3 verse 30 in the New King James Version says this, we must increase, sorry, he must increase, but I must decrease. Charles Spurgeon, a great theologian said this, when your will is God's will, you will have your will. When your will is God's will, you will have your will. It's a question, what am I seeking control over? And here's the thing, every time I try and control, I'm creating, creating a counterfeit for the promise of God. He was, he, you were promised unconditional love, don't settle for lust. You were promised joy, don't settle for momentary pleasure. You were promised peace, don't settle for temporary relief. You were promised purpose, don't settle for prosperity. Go discover in the Word what you are promised because we need to realize whenever we try and take control back, what we're doing is we're creating a counterfeit for God's promise in our life. Because this is why I know me and you, we can't provide those things. Why? Because they can only be provided by a good, holy, righteous, magnificent, awesome God. And when we surrender to Him, He brings us the promise. We have to surrender our pre preference to His pathways. So question tonight, what thing, if taken away, would cause me to have a crisis of identity. Crisis this morning, by the way, I said tonight, but yeah, here we are. I would love to think about it for a second. And actually, I would love you if you have a note-taking device or maybe you have a notepad because you're more holy than the person sitting next to you. Um, I actually want you to write it down. I want you to take a moment. I'm going to put the Word of God into practice today, right? Like, it's not just, I don't just want to preach. I want to, let's talk about the Word, right? It's put into practice. So write it down. What thing, if taken away, we've all got something, would cause a moment or a crisis of identity? It's a great revealer of what God is saying we need to surrender and give Him control of. It's a great revealer where we're trying to get control and our identity begins to wrap up in something that it was never been, meant to be wrapped up in. And this morning, to help us with whatever you wrote down, whatever is the thing that you need to surrender control over to God in your life, to, to help us understand how or a way we can do that, I want to look at a person in the Bible. His name is Abraham. You would know him quite well um, if you've been in church for a long time. But if you don't, he is found in the Old Testament, which is 
the first half of the, uh, the Bible, and he's found in the first book of the Bible called Genesis. Uh, and we're going to be reading from Genesis chapter 22. So if you have your actual paper Bible, or if you want to scroll there, turn to it now. But before we jump in there, I just want to give you some context as to who Abraham was. The Bible calls him the father of our faith. Basically, uh, God calls Abraham to, it says, a foreign land. And this is what God says when he calls him. He says, hey, I want you to pick up, pack up your family, leave your relative, leave the country you know, leave everything you know, and I want you to go to this land. And he says this. He doesn't even tell him where he's going. He says, I'll show you. Imagine being like, hey, we're jumping in the car. Where are we going? Hey, don't worry about it. I'll show you. What? Like God, God says, I'll show you. This is the level of faith and trust and surrender that Abraham has in God, right? This is his life. And then we see that he receives a promise that there'll be descendants that will outnumber the stars and the, and the sand on the, on the seashore. And there'll be a nation that's birthed out of him. Only problem, him and his wife, they're too old to have kids. And so there's this promise that's given by God. And then they wait 25 years from when the promise is given to when the sun comes. And there's a lot that happens in there. You can go read for yourself in Genesis. I'm kind of tr- trying to give you an overview for time, but... The, the, the 25 years, right? So not only is Abraham just a, a surrendered life following, but he gets a promise and he lives surrendered for 25 years. There's a couple of moments in there like we all have where there's a couple of weak moments where we try to do it in our own strength and he tries to take control back. But ultimately he lives surrendered 25 years. And then we pick up the story once Isaac has born his son. So Abraham and Isaac, and we pick it up in chapter 22, verse one. Now, I'm gonna preface something. We've got 14 verses to read here, all right? Yeah, 14 verses, all right? So we're going to lock in. We're going to read the Word. And none of you should be like, oh, 14 verses because it's the Word of God. And we love reading the Word of God. And we need the whole context of the Word of God, all right? So if any of you rolled your eyes just then, gotcha. Nah. 14 verses, chapter, uh, verse one, chapter 22, verse 1. Reading from the NIV translation. It will be up on the screen so you can follow. Awesome. Thanks, Jen. Can we get off of Jen, by the way? Jen's at the back there through my Bible verses and all that. She's on point today. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and and here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Hectic. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son, Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he sent out... Uh, Sorry, uh, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. Underline this bit, we will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, father, Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is a lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar and on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on this boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that, you're, that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. (coughs) So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. If it's your first time hearing that story, potential full-on story, like what is going on here? Really quickly, I'm just going to give some context to the request because uh, often we can read the scripture um, based on our context, and that's the incorrect way to read the Scripture. You've got to read Scripture based on the context of the day, right? And um, there's actually a, a video on our, our YouTube channel by Shane Willard who does this incredible teaching on this whole thing, but I would encourage you to go look at that because I don't have the time to unpack it as much or, or even necessarily the anointing and the skill to do it like that. But uh, basically the context of the day is that pagan gods would often request or people believe they would often request for their first child or their children to be sacrificed in an act of worship. So the, the, the request is not 
is not out of context for the day. What is different is the way God interacts and responds to it, right? So I'm just going to give you that. There's a whole thing we can unpack. Come talk to me afterwards and I can give you the link to that video if you want to know more about that and you're a bit confused. But for today, I want to focus on this subject, Abraham's surrender. And the lessons we can learn from Abraham are how we can surrender control over to God. So I've got three lessons for us, all right? Three lessons. Number one, surrender is an act of worship. Surrender is an act of worship. Abraham says this. It says, stay here with the donkey while I'm the boy, go over there. It says, we will worship. We will worship. See, Abraham saw surrender as worship. Why? Because worship is acknowledging God's lordship in our lives. And when we control places and we're trying to put ourselves as God in a situation, what we're really doing is worshiping ourselves. But when we surrender, what it is, it's an act of worship of going, God, you are the one who decides my steps. Why? For you are Lord of my life. So you can only worship what is Lord in your life. And whatever you don't surrender, you will end up serving and you will end up worshiping. But when we surrender it to God, our worship begins to pour out. Why? Because when we lay our lives down, it becomes worship to the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. His name is Jesus. Abraham understood that surrender is in fact worship. See, surrender positions us, positions God, sorry, back in the rightful place of our life. Surrendering my wants is always worship. Romans 12 verse 1 says this. This is Paul writing. It says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. This is your true and proper worship. Every time a young couple decides to not have sex until they're married, that is a worship moment. Every time someone decides to live a life of generosity, that is a worship moment. Every time someone decides to forgive, that is a worship moment. Why? Because it's all of us offering our lives as a surrender and sacrifice, going, God, you are the one. I trust you more than anything else. I will let you decide my wants to the side, your will at the foreground. And when I do that, it's actually worship in my life. And so know this, it's not about doing and not doing, it's about the fact that we all have an opportunity on a daily basis to to surrender and as a result, worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The opportunity is worship. So my question for this point is this, if someone were to look at my life, what song would it be singing? If someone were to look at my life, what song would it be singing? I'm so grateful for my parents because they set a great example of this for me in my life. They understood that surrender was worship. I'm so grateful because uh, when I was a lot younger, in about year four, my parents felt called to plant a church in Canberra. And here's the thing is that we didn't know anyone in Canberra. They didn't know anyone in Canberra. They just felt the call of God in their life. And they surrendered their wants, which was to be around family and community and life to follow the call of God in their life. So they went and we planted a church and it's still going strong to this day. It's awesome. I'm so proud and so grateful for the example. Why? Because my dad had a conviction that surrender is worship. That there was nothing that was off limits. That his wants, yes, were to be around family and community as it is for all of us. And yes, it is that. But God had called him to a place where he didn't know anyone. He had to build and restart. And I'm so thankful that I had that example in my life. And if you didn't have that example, that's okay. Because the scriptures can be that example for us. For us to live surrendered is a worship, is worship in our life. So if someone were to look at my life, what song would be singing? Number two, surrender is trusting God's character. Isn't it interesting that Abraham says, we will worship and then we will come back to you. No one told him that. But here's the thing, Abraham trusted in God's unflinching character over the confusing request. Let me say it again, Abraham trusted in God's unflinching character over the confusing request. Hebrews 11 verse 19 says this, Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. This is how surrendered Abraham was. Abraham understood it wasn't about the request, it was about the character of God. That even though he did not understand, he didn't have to understand. 
Right, Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 6 says, Do not lean on your own understanding, but in every way submit your ways to God and He will make your path straight, right? So Abraham understood that his surrender wasn't based on understanding because he knew the character of God. And he knew, like he knew that my God is good, that my God is holy, that He is a good God who has good things for me. And as a result, I can rely and trust in His character even when the request is confusing. Even when it's confusing, even when it doesn't make sense, why? I can stand firm knowing His character is good. And as a result, His will is good. And as a result, when I walk in obedience, I will walk in His goodness, not my own. See, God is a good God. See, surrender is always a test of trust. And I think that often myself and I think many of us fear surrender because we think that what we're holding on to is greater than what God can actually give back into our hands. We're scared of letting go of control or the thing that's in our hands because we think, if we're really honest, we struggle to trust that God can actually give us something better and greater. We struggle that maybe believe that God's character is that good that He would actually present it to us. And often it reveals a lack of believing in the goodness and the character of God. And this is why I want to encourage you that studying the Word is so important. Not just something you do, once again, not religious in terms of you have to do this to gain good favor. No, because it reveals the character of God to you. The canon of Scripture is a beautiful thing and it will reveal the character of God to you. And so in a moment of a confusing request, you'll be able to stand firm and strong, surrendered. Why? Because you understand the character of God. Because you understand the character. He's a good God. He is our provider and a promise keeper. So when we surrender, it invites God in to be our provider. Remember, Abraham says this, uh, he called the place the Lord will provide. And on this day, to this day, it said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. In other words, on the mountain of surrender, it will be provided. So when you surrender, it invites God to be your provider, not you to be your provider. And I don't know about you, but I would love the king of the universe, the one who created everything, the one who knows me, the one who knows you, the one who has infinite power, the one who has infinite wisdom, the one who has infinite understanding to be the one who provides for me, not me providing for myself. So when it comes to my understanding, when it comes to things that I get confused about or my wisdom or my knowledge, I don't want to rely on me. I want to rely on Him. I want to rely on Him. For us, this journey in me and Ashari look like getting a moment where, yes, I mentioned before, we have a beautiful daughter, her name is Zareya. She's eight months old, she's incredible. And like so many people, I know even in this room who were praying and believing for, there was the, the, the process of falling pregnant wasn't a smooth one. And there was a very real reality that we might not be able to have kids. And I remember we were sitting in the car, literally together, and we had to, I, we, I just felt so strongly. It was, it, we were trying to process it, go cool. Like it's not, it's not cemented in stone, but it's also like very open. How do we, what, what's going on? I just remember so clearly going, Shari, we cannot say we believe in a God and trust and not trust Him with this. Yeah. We cannot say we believe in a good God and not trust that even if we can't have kids, that He has a better and greater plan for it. Yeah. And even though our desire and my want is for that and my prayer is still gonna be for it, I have to be able to hold it and we have to be able to hold it open because I cannot say I believe God is God of the universe but then not give Him control over this. And I'm so grateful and we're so blessed that God was gracious enough to be able to bless us with an incredible daughter. But this is what my prayers look like every day since. Every single day I pray this. In my prayer time, I do my Bible reading and then I pray, I pray for my wife. And then I say this, I say, God, thank you for Zareah, but I thank you that she's not mine and that she is yours. Because it reminds me that yes, my desire in my heart and I love it a bit, but God is my number one love and He is the one I serve and He is the one I follow, not the promise of a potential family. But my King and my Lord. See, God will ask you to uh, surrender things that He's even provided for you. So question, do I love God more than the things He can do for me? And the last point is this, as the band comes up to join me. Surrender is not an event, but a life laid down. See, surrender is an everyday process. It's not a singular event. I would put it this way. The Christian life is a process of yielding all of myself that I know to all of a God that I know. In other words, that as I learn more about God and as I learn more about myself, it reveals areas of control that I need to surrender again. 
as you discover more about yourself, as you go through life and reveals, as you, as you discover more about God through the scriptures and through this transformation journey we're all on, it reveals areas of our life that we haven't given up control yet. And the, the thing for us as a Christian, as one who's devoted to following Jesus, we have to be ready to surrender control of those areas over. So God reveals areas so that we might learn to surrender them. Not that we might learn to control them better. As I mentioned, Abraham's story is a life full of surrender. God called him to leave the country, his relatives and his father, to a place that he will show him. The promise took 25 years to come to fruition. Then God asked him to sacrifice the promise. It's a life of surrender, not a moment of surrender. And this is the thing, yeah, we all, we all have times where we control creeps back in, right? The cycle of control creeps back in and we begin gripping. But here's the beautiful thing. All it takes is a single moment of surrender to break that cycle. It doesn't take a process. It takes a single moment of surrender. A single choice, a single moment to say, hey, I find myself trying to grip back control. I'm going to surrender this to my God who has full control over everything. The decisions I make today determine my tomorrow. And a lifestyle of surrender, surrender is built on daily surrender. It's built on every day, getting in my secret place with Jesus and going, Jesus, I surrender afresh. Show me, teach me, reveal to me. Take control of this. God, I don't want to, I'm finding myself trying to grip and make this happen. God, you're the only one who can make it happen. You can't change your spouse. God can though. You can't change them. God can. And He'll also often change you first as well. Which I think sometimes why we don't pray that prayer, right? It's like, surrender, but God, I know it's coming to me first and I don't... But remember, we're all on a transformation journey. We're all on a transformation journey. Question, what previously good thing is God asking me to surrender today? What previously good thing is God asking me to surrender today? And yes, are we free in Christ? Absolutely. But as Paul says, not everything is beneficial. So just because something is, is in sin doesn't mean it's of God. All right? <laughs> Are you living surrendered? Or do you like the control you have to decide what is okay, what's not?